Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and welcome to The Vine, which is our online campus. This month is an exciting month in the life of our church. It's what we call camp meeting, where we try to recapture the spirit of the old camp meetings back in the 1800s with uh, great special music and testimonies and the usual great preaching and so on and so forth. We're so glad that you have decided to join us for this worship service today. And our prayer is that God will bless you, that God will speak to your heart today through this worship service. God bless you. Once again, welcome. And let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We continue in worship now as I lead us in our opening prayer. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and light of your church. Open our hearts to the riches of your grace that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit in love, joy, and peace. Bless us this day as we've gathered to bless you with our praise and thanksgiving. Bless us, O Lord, in order that we might be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Scott Wiston, and I've attended this church for 35 years. See, and I started here, and we were looking for a place to get married, and we heard about this cool female pastor. This church has nourished and supported us ever since in ways too numerous to list. Today I want to talk in terms of being a 13-year cancer survivor. Those six months undergoing chemo were made more bearable because of many of you here today. I learned four great lessons during my time as a cancer patient that I swore would stick with me as long as I lived. I have forgotten one of them already. Nonetheless, here are the three I recall. One, there is no such thing as a small act. Every card, every meal, every phone call, every kindness, they all matter more than you can know. My college roommate's mother, a breast cancer survivor, sent me a card every week for 24 weeks. When we had a I'm well party, once it was over, we stapled all my cards onto our backyard fence and it was overwhelming. No one set out to fix my issue, they just sent a card. But it all contributed to something larger. I told the group that day that I had seen the face of God and then pointed at every one of them. Two, if someone offers to do something to help and you sense they mean it, give them something to do. This is not the time to play hero ball. Your friends and family need to know they did something in your time of need. Don't take that from them. Three, if something is worth doing in the name of God, then do it well. A friend from my Sunday school class offered to mow my yard. I let him. See rule number two. He didn't just mow it, he brought a trailer full of equipment. He weeded, he edged. Our backyard was shocked to see such tools. Around this time, Bob Bauman told me about a woman who found a forgotten freezer in her basement with a turkey inside. It had been there about 20 years. She called Butterball, or whoever you call about these things, and they told her that, well, if the power had stayed on, the turkey is probably still edible, but it likely lost its flavor. She said, okay, I'll give it to the church. I think God deserves better. He deserves our best. The question is, what does that look like? For cancer survivors, that question is a little different, though equally poignant. When I struggled during early chemo, there were fellow patients who held my hand who I knew wouldn't make it. They died and I didn't. Why was I the lucky one who survived? Why am I still here? I'd love to report that surviving cancer or any trauma brings clarity of purpose. It does not. It doesn't even correct the faults you had before. In my case, it does bring a certain impatience. 
Many is the time I have been in a situation and thought, I didn't survive cancer just to do this or for this to happen. This brings me to my work as outreach chairman here. We have people who are hungry, yet Mother Hubbard's cupboard shelves are dwindling. We have people who can't get in their houses, yet warm struggles to find volunteers to build ramps. We have disabled children and adults who never get to be the hero in athletics, yet too few of us know about the miracle field. There are some things we are just not meant to tolerate. Today, I'm asking you to join me in a holy intolerance. I'm announcing today some breaking news. Our committee wants to focus primarily to support teachers in our high poverty schools, specifically Snipes Elementary, but hopefully others. We're calling it Teach Reach. That's a play on outreach, and you'll hear a lot more about it soon. We know by now the struggle Snipes has had, but did you know that Rachel Freeman Elementary, out of 100 1,514 elementary schools in North Carolina is literally the lowest ranked in the state. Meanwhile, two other schools, one of them right up the street, are in the top 10. How does this disparity exist? Because we as a community tolerate it. What if we became the church that supports teachers with a car, a cup of coffee, a meal? What if we collect or sponsor supplies for their classrooms? What if we buy uniform clothes, underwear, socks for children, and let guidance counselors shop for their students' needs? During the week in which he knew he was about to die, Jesus told his followers, Give to those in need from the core of who you are, and you will be clean all over. Who was he talking to? I believe he was talking to me. I'd like to think he was talking to all of us. If you were so moved, give to the church and designate it for Teach Reach. Next month, we're starting a drive to collect children's books. 60% of poor families don't have a book in their home. Many of your children have outgrown these books. Here's a place to bring them. This is a win-win. None of us has outlived whatever happened in our lives so we can watch children fail for lack of attention. Please join our team. Become an ambassador. It just means I'll let you know when opportunities arise. Sign up on the bulletin board outside the door. I hope you'll support Teach Reach, but just let us know what moves you to act and we'll help you match to the need that you want to address. We can't, individually or as a church, lift children out of poverty ourselves. We can bring in a box of books. We can read to a child in school. We can bring a teacher a Danish and a card. Please join our effort. There is no such thing as a small act. Thank you. I went down to the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown, good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down to the river to pray. Hello Church, I'm Anusio Kang, one of the associate pastors here. It is a great joy to lead us in prayer today. Please join me as we pray together. Almighty God, we are so blessed to be gathered here this day, the first Sunday in Camp Meeting Month, seeking nourishment for our souls. You remind us of the blessings we have and the opportunities to share those blessings with others. We praise and we thank you for all these things and for your constant presence with us. Gracious God, we confess that 
we have fallen short of your glorious standard in our thought, words, and actions. We acknowledge our need for your forgiveness and ask that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank you for the gift of your Son Jesus, who paid the ultimate price on the cross to atone for our sins. We are grateful that his sacrifice has provided us with a way to stand before you. We ask for the help of the Holy Spirit to guide us in overcoming the sin in our life. Empower us to resist temptation and to grow in our relationship with you, reflecting your love and grace to those around us. Loving God, we especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our heart. Lord, we thank you for your healing mercies and your sustaining love for us. Bless all those whom we have named before you in our heart and with our voices. Touch each life with your peace. Help us to be faithful to you in all times and in all places. We humbly offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we have time to offer our hearts and gifts, I would like to remind you that you can give the ministry of Ricefield United Methodist Church through our website, smartphone apps, and through mail. Let us continue to worship God. Now it's time for the children's message. So if you have children or youth who are nearby who aren't already watching this video, now's a great time to call them over because I've got some things to share with them today. Hey guys, I'm Pastor David and I've got the children's message today. And well, actually, I had a little problem this morning and I, I feel like I should probably tell you what happened. I was so embarrassed. Oh, I came into church and I was carrying this big bag. And the other pastor said, well, what's a bag for? And I said, well, for camping. And they said, what? I said, for camping, you know, camping. Like I've got my sleeping bag in here because this is camp meeting month, so we're all going camping, right? And I've got my camping hat to wear, and um, I've got my camping pillow. I've got my water bottle. See, I've got all my camping supplies. I've even got my camping lantern. Whoa, that's bright. <clears throat> and... I've got a granola bar and I've got a flashlight. I've got all of these camping supplies. I was all ready to go camping. And they're like, Pastor David, camp meeting month doesn't mean we're going camping, not literally. Well, they explained it to me and now I understand. Back in the old days, like 200 years ago, they would have these, these uh, meetings where people would gather from far and wide for preaching services, and they would come on horseback, they would come in 
covered wagons because back then they didn't have automobiles. There were no motels for them to stay in, so they literally camped for a week and cooked over an open fire. And they had preaching and singing and just all kinds of special things to encourage people in their faith. Well, when we have camp meeting month at Riceville United Methodist Church, we're, we're not going camping. We're just trying to recapture some of the spirit of those revivals that they used to have 200 years ago where people got really excited about their faith in God. They got really excited about Jesus and His love for us and the way that God's Holy Spirit works in our lives. So as we go through the worship services this month, camp meeting month, yeah, don't, don't make the same mistake I did. It's not about going camping, but it's about having a great time at church and really getting excited about our faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you that we have camp meeting month, and while it would certainly be a lot of fun to go camping, um, help us, Lord, to realize that we get an even greater benefit just by getting excited about our faith with this, this special focus and special emphasis. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the children and youth of our church and community and their families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage this morning. Our passage comes to us from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 3, beginning at verse 21. Hear this now. But now, irrespective of the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me now? Holy and loving God, we your people are longing today to hear from you. God, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak to your people. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you've had a conversation with me for more than about 10 minutes, then you probably know that I am a huge Taylor Swift fan. So this past fall, when Taylor Swift released a new album, I was so excited to listen to all of the songs. One of my favorites that immediately stood out is a song called Antihero. And if you have listened to the radio at all in the past 12 months, you've probably heard it. The chorus goes like this. It's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. At tea time, everybody agrees. I'll stare directly at the sun, but never in the mirror. It must be exhausting, always rooting for the anti-hero. In addition to being an absolute earworm, when I heard this song, I couldn't help but think about Romans. Now, in order for that to make sense, I think we need to start at the beginning. Paul's letter to the Romans is different than his letters to the other churches. Most of his letters were written to churches that he had started himself and that he spent significant amounts of time with. But when Paul wrote to the church in Rome, he actually hadn't met them yet. He sent his letter before him because he was planning to visit, but hadn't yet. The letter went before him to explain the Christian faith to the young church. 
Remember, this is only about 20 or 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So things that we now take for granted as fundamentals of our faith hadn't really been firmed up and agreed upon yet. For Paul, sending a clear summary of the gospel was especially important because there was a group of people going around to the churches and telling them that in order to be a Christian, you first had to become Jewish. You can see the logic in that, right? Jesus was Jewish and was a teacher of Jewish law. All his disciples were Jewish. And he specifically said multiple times that he came to serve the lost sheep of Israel. It makes sense then that Christianity would be a movement within the Jewish religion. The people who were pushing this position weren't trying to be exclusive. Gentiles, that is all of us, everyone who wasn't Jewish, could become Christians. It was just that in their minds, being a Christian also meant being circumcised and following Jewish law. But Paul believed something different. He was convinced that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus changed absolutely everything. He was convinced that in Jesus, God had found a way to set the world right with God without the law. And yet, at the same time, this new reality didn't mean that the law didn't matter. Paul's letter to the Romans is essentially answering the question, what does Jesus' life, death, and resurrection mean for the Jewish religion, for how we live, and for the whole world? Paul was mostly writing this letter to Christian Jews. So he starts off by trying to convince them that pious Jews and not just Gentiles are guilty of sin. In the first chapter of Romans, Paul describes how the Gentiles— have fallen victim to the power of sin. He gives this litany of practices that any good Jew would find absolutely abhorrent. Idol worship, sexual immorality, you name it. Paul has his Jewish listeners listening and nodding and going, yeah, that's right. Those Gentiles are awful. That's why they need to follow Jewish customs before they can become Christians. But then Paul flips the script. Not so fast, he says. He ends his critique with this gut-wrenching claim. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Suddenly, the Jews are the ones under the microscope, and they have to realize that they have been just as affected by the power of sin as the Gentiles have. In fact, it might even be a worse situation for them because God has spoken directly to them. Suddenly, they have to say, wait, I'm the problem? This moment, this moment of admitting that you've done something wrong, that you're guilty, it's hard to bear. Brene Brown, who researches vulnerability, argues that there's a meaningful difference between guilt and shame. According to Brene Brown, shame is always harmful. But she writes this, guilt is adaptive and helpful. It's holding something we've done or failed to do up against our values and feeling psychological discomfort. Even though guilt is adaptive and helpful, meaning that it motivates change and growth in our lives, it hurts to feel it. And we can go to extreme lengths in an attempt to avoid that pain. When we begin to feel guilt, our first instinct is to hide, to avoid confrontation. You can see this happening even in Genesis. After Adam and Eve eat the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what's the first thing they do? They hide. They make clothes out of fig leaves to try to cover up their bodies, which suddenly feel wrong and bad. When they hear God's voice, instead of running towards God, they run away and hide themselves among the trees. We avoid guilt all the time, too. Have you ever dodged a coworker because you know that you didn't meet a deadline or you disagreed with them at a meeting? Have you ever gone down a different aisle at Harris Teeter 
because you saw someone that you had had a fight with? When avoidance doesn't work anymore, we try denial. We deny doing what we did. We say that it was someone or something else. Honestly, I find myself doing this pretty frequently. Oh, I wasn't late to that meeting because I left my house 10 minutes after when I knew I needed to leave to be on time. I just got stuck in traffic. Or we justify. We say that what we really did isn't so bad after all. Think about it. This is basically how court proceedings go. You can plead innocence and claim that you didn't do the thing that you're accused of, or you can plead guilty, but argue that there are extenuating circumstances that explain why it really isn't so bad after all. Recently, I heard a story of a woman who wasn't able to argue her way out of a conviction. She had been driving while drunk, and she hit another car. The driver in the other car was okay, but her teenage son, who was in the passenger seat, was killed. Rightfully, the woman was sentenced to a prison term. For the first several years of her sentence, she was furious and miserable. She was convinced that what she had done really wasn't that bad after all, that she was in jail just on a technicality in her case. She spent any time that was available to her fighting for parole or for her sentence to be overturned. Finally, one day, one of the prison guards pulled her aside and said, look, you are always going to be miserable until you take responsibility for what you did. I know something that can help. If you want to get better, come to one of the Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Well, maybe it was because she would rather be in a meeting than in her cell alone, or maybe it was because she saw something in that prison guard that looked like hope. But for whatever reason, the woman went to that meeting. Once she started getting involved in the community, with the help of the community, she was able to truly face for the first time what she had done. She was able to fully feel the guilt of having taken a life away from a person who was completely innocent. It hurt. It hurt really, really bad. And yet, admitting that guilt was the thing that helped her begin to get free, to be able to get free from her addiction and to find a more meaningful life. Most of us will never need to accept responsibility in such a dramatic way. But this passage doesn't give us the luxury of turning off our ears and assuming that the message is for someone else. The buildup to this passage has been to prove that both Jews and Gentiles are responsible and guilty for sin. Paul finally hits home with this. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Message Bible, which is a paraphrase, puts it this way. For there is no difference between us and them in this. We've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. Everyone is guilty. And everyone means you. There is no distinction between us when it comes to our guilt. There is no distinction between me and you and the woman who killed a teenage boy. I'm not counted differently than she is or how you are. Regardless of what you've done or haven't done, all of us are incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. Everyone is guilty and everyone means you. But here's the beautiful thing. Hear what comes after the verses that I just read. For there is no distinction, since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. 
Here it is again in the message paraphrase, for there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us, God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. If there's no difference between us when it comes to our guilt, there also is no difference between us when it comes to what Jesus has done. Everyone is guilty. Everyone means you. The gospel is for everyone. And everyone means you. Eleven years ago, my life was changed forever when I went to Lakeside for Youth, a Methodist summer camp on, in Ohio on Lake Erie. I had been a Christian my whole life, and my family and I rarely missed a Sunday at the Episcopal Church where I grew up. I sang in the children's choir, I went to Sunday school, and I was in VBS every single summer. Around the time I was in middle school, though, my family started going to a different church, a United Methodist Church. Maybe it was because the worship was different, or maybe it was just because I was a skeptical teenager, but I was somewhat suspicious of this new church. I was especially unsure of the youth group. My parents gently encouraged me to get involved, but I found lots of clever excuses not to go to any of the events. Finally, when I was 15, I was hemming and hawing about going to camp, so my mom finally just signed me up and told me I was going. Well, once I got there, it turns out that the camp was pretty great. And even though there were still lots of things that I was unfamiliar with, I started to feel God's presence stirring in my heart. On Thursday night during worship, one of the worship leaders stood up and made an invitation. If there was anyone who wanted to say yes to Jesus, they could come up on the stage and be prayed for. As she said it, I almost rolled my eyes. I knew what this was. It was called an altar call, and it was something that might happen at these crazy Methodist summer camps. But the very moment that I thought that, I felt another voice in my heart, not audible, but impossible to ignore. This is for you. I knew the voice was God, but I fought back. This isn't for me. This is for those people who have something really wrong in their lives. The ones who are drinking or smoking or are being bullied or who aren't Christians. But still, I felt God's insistent voice. This is for you. Before my head knew what was happening, my feet started moving. When I made it up to that stage, I was weeping and I felt God's presence in a way that was truer and more real and tangible than ever before in my life. And that moment of realizing that something was for me that the gospel was for me, even me, is what started my life on a different trajectory that has now ended me up in this pulpit. I wanna tell you today, whoever you are, wherever you find yourself, this is for you. The gospel is for everyone and everyone means you. Will you pray with me now? Holy and loving God, we thank you that you show no difference between us, that God, just as all of us are guilty, all of us are offered new life through Jesus Christ. God, I pray that today we would say yes to that new life, 
that we would understand that this is an offer made not to someone else, not for those people, but for us, even us. God, help us to say yes. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, go today knowing that this, this gospel, this offer of life is for you. And as you go, may the spirit of the living God, made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, go before you to show you the way. Go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own. Go above you to watch over you and protect you. Go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand. Go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace.